foundation of any democracy. And the rules that govern any election determine whether or not it's fair. Algorithmic thinking can help us to design better elections. This talk will show you how. The student assembly elections at Lenrock University um, allow the fraternity Alpha Delta Omicron to have three representatives. Now, the fraternity is a diverse group, but for simplicity, let's just assume that they fall into roughly two groups. The jocks that make up 60% of the fraternity members and the geeks that make up 40%. And we'll assume that each fraternity member tends to vote along its own demographic. So let's think about running this election. And there are three candidates that are jocks, Al, Ben, and Cord. And there are three geeks, Dan, Eli, and Finn. We need to have three representatives. How can we do this in a way that's fair? And what might even fair mean? One approach might be that we simply have each fraternity member vote for their top three candidates. And then the top three vote getters are declared the winners. Is this fair? Well, if you think about the demographics here, since a majority of the fraternity members are jocks, it's likely that Al, Ben, and Cord will all win, and none of the geeks will win. We're used to the rules of a representative democracy where minority interests have a voice in proportion to the overall population. And so we more expect that there should be maybe a two to one outcome, two jobs and one geek in a fair election. An alternative that's been gaining some traction in state and local elections has been something called ranked choice voting, where rather than voting for just your selected candidates, you provide a complete ordering of all the candidates, from your favorite down to the least favorite. Let's make these a little simpler at first, and think about where there are only three candidates, Al, Ben, and Cord, and they're only doing one, they're only electing one representative. So here you see different ballots, and maybe your particular ballot has Ben first, then Al, then Cord. How should we decide who wins? Well, Let's say there are 100 ballots, and Ben gets 38 votes, and Cord gets 36 votes, and Al gets 26. Who wins? Well, I'd say one option is Ben wins. He got the most votes. But another thing is you might want a majority support for the ultimate winner. So you might have a runoff. And in that runoff, then you might think about how that would work and how to use ranked choice voting to do that right away. Here you have the initial votes, but what's happening in the runoff is that Al's votes get divided and split between Cord and Ben. Let's say they went 18 to Cord and 8 to Ben, and all of a sudden now you see that Cord ultimately has a majority of the votes and Cord is the winner. And ranked choice voting allows us to do this right away without doing a runoff. But the key here is that you ended up with a half, more than half of the vote. Now let's turn back to the elections at Alpha Delta Omicron in the original setting where we want to have three winners. And I'm going to walk you through how we can use ranked choice voting to get a fair outcome in that case. Before, getting more than half of the votes is sure to win. Now, the corresponding fraction is that if I get more than a quarter of the votes, that assures me a top three finish, right? Because if I have more than a quarter, then certainly there can be three other people that get more votes than I do. But now consider a situation where Al has like three quarters of the vote. What should happen then? There aren't even two candidates who have a quarter left. We'll create a new second rule of redistributing votes because Al only needs that quarter and will redistribute his votes. All right, we'll see how to do this on a particular example. Here's, let's say, our 100 ballots for the votes in, the, in our Alpha Delta, Delta Omicron election, and Al gets 27 votes. That's more than the quarter, so we'll lock in the quarter that he needed to win, and we'll redistribute the excess two votes. If you look at the ballots that voted for Al first, half of them have Ben second, and the other half have Cord second. So let's take those two excess votes and divide them, one to Ben, and one to court, and now we have this picture. 
Ah, but nobody now has a quarter. So now we'll go back to the rule we used before and say, look at the person who had the least votes. That's Finn. And look at all the remaining second place votes on Finn's ballot, and the ballots that voted for Finn, and redistribute them according to those remaining second place choices. And that gives us another rule. We still aren't done, but we can proceed with these two rules, either redistributing the, the first low man on the totem pole, or as here we see Ben wins and we redistribute his excess votes, until ultimately we have three winners. And we see in this outcome that the three winners are Al, Ben, and Dan. Two jocks and a geek. The kind of outcome we had hoped for in the first place. And this isn't a coincidence. We can mathematically prove that this mechanism assures that the ultimate outcome goes along the lines of the, roughly according to the proportion of the voters overall. So this is the way that we can run elections in a local setting. This is also useful in thinking about what happens in US congressional elections. Once every 10 years, as we did just now in 2020, there is a census that allocates for each state in the country how many representatives each state gets. In this case, let's say New York gets 26 representatives, just like Alpha Delta Omicron had three representatives for their election. And then each state gets to divide the state up according to its own math to figure out, well, instead of having 26 representatives overall, we're going to have 26 districts, each with one representative. And the party in power has a tremendous amount of control over how that map gets drawn, and as a result, controlling the elections in the future. Let me show you how this can work. Here's a very simple state. There are 50 what I'll call precincts, each of those little squares. Let's say they each have 100,000 voters in them. And for simplicity, let's just assume that each square, which is either red or blue, to indicate whether all the voters in that state vote for the red, or all the voters in that precinct vote for, for the blue. And you can see overall that there are about 60% blue precincts and 40% red precincts, and that gives us a split of the population overall. Well, if blue was in control and could draw the map, then this state has five districts, each with 10 precincts, and we can see those 10, five precincts indicated by the black lines, and in this case, you see that each of those five districts has a majority of blue voters. So blue gets to control all of the seats in this state. On the other hand, if red were drawing the map, it might choose to pack all of the um, blue precincts into those two central districts, and then actually controls the other three districts. Um, and although it's a minority party in total vote overall, it's controlling, red is controlling a majority of the districts. So on the one hand, blue cracked the red vote into powerless pieces, versus in the other map, red packed the blue so as to gain control for itself. This isn't just an artifact of my toy example. This happens all the time. In North Carolina, the overall vote is roughly 50-50 Republican and Democrat. But here you can see a map from one of the congressional elections in the last decade that nine of the 13 seats are actually controlled by the Republicans. And this was a function of how the map was drawn. So as we think about drawing a map for a, a state, we want to have a notion of what makes a map fair. And one way that we can think about this is something that's called the proportionality gap. And we can use historical data to estimate what fraction of the overall population we expect to vote for each party. So like in this case, we might expect the Republican vote share is 50%. On the other hand, for this map, we might expect that the Republican seat share is 69%, 9 thirteens. And this gives rise to a proportionality gap that's 19%, which is really huge. And our goal might be, in thinking about a map being fair, is to make this proportionality gap as small as possible. Another metric for how to thinking about whether a given state map is fair is has to do with the compactness of each of these districts. The term gerrymandering, which is commonly used, 
refers to these long filigree districts that really imagine all kinds of crazy things to happen. And you can see a particularly extreme and absurd example here in this Pennsylvania map from the 2010 uh, drawing for, for out of the 2010 census. So how do we measure how compact a plan is? Let's go back to our toy simple state. One way to think about how compact a state is is to simply sum up the perimeter of each of the districts. So the middle plan that I'm showing you, which is a compact one, if I add up the perimeter of those five uh, districts, the total perimeter is 70. But if you add up the perimeter of this much more filigree plan, then the total perimeter is 100. And so we have a way of measuring whether or not plans are compact. Proportionality and compactness are competing objectives. And so in these three maps, we're showing you different trade-offs between being more compact but less proportional. But often there's a sweet spot. So in the map on the bottom, we see a map which is nearly proportional and also quite compact. So this is doable overall. Now, one thing I haven't talked about to date is how do we actually do this? Then, if you think about even this 50 example, 50 precinct example, there are scores and scores of different state plans. The important thing is that we have the computational power in order to actually think about constructing what are good plans. And if you think about this small map, in comparison to North Carolina, which has 2,000 precincts, not just 50, there are literally billions and billions of state maps. But with that many different possible state maps, it's not that we have the computational power to look at them one at a time or one after the other and evaluate how things they fare with respect to any given metric. What we have are tools called optimization algorithms. Algorithms that, are, without looking at each possible solution one at a time, enable us to make conclusions like, this is the most proportionate map, or among compact maps, or reasonably compact maps, this is the most democratic leaning. And that gives us the ability to figure out what is doable and also what isn't doable. Because unfortunately, it's the case that not all states, in fact, most states don't have proportionate districting plans. Massachusetts is a prototypical example here. Massachusetts is about a 70-30 Democratic to Republican split. It has nine districts, but the Republican minority is relatively evenly distributed throughout the state. And so drawing a map for Massachusetts where it's likely that even more than one district is Republican is really quite challenging. And as I said, this isn't an exception. It's, this is kind of the rule. Most states don't have good proportionate maps. So what's the solution? The solution is to use some of the insight we got from our Alpha Delta Omicron uh, fraternity and to take advantage of what are often called multi-member districts. Consider Texas. Texas has 36 seats in the House of Representatives. And so normally now we would have 36 districts to represent that. But instead, imagine that we grouped those districts into groups of three, so that there are now 12 districts, sort of multi-member districts, that each elect three representatives. By doing the same principle that we used for Alpha Delta Omicron in electing three representatives, it's likely that a significant minority in one of these multi-member districts would actually elect two representatives in one party and one in the other, and thereby balance the, the power and attain a proportionate result. And furthermore, perhaps even more importantly, by building in this mechanism, we greatly limit the power of strong partisan interests to draw maps that disproportionately favor one party or another. So this gives us a tool for, for achieving fair, a fair outcome. So I hope I've given you a sense of how optimization models and algorithms can be used to make fairer elections. But these tools can be used in a range of settings to lead to societally improved results. 
And this might be in bare mechanisms for matching riders and cars and lift, building a better final exam schedule for Cornell University, or thinking about long-term environmentally minded land use planning in saving endangered species. But the bottom line is we have the optimization models and, and, and algorithms that can, empowered by the digital revolution, help us make decisions that will help make the world a better place. Thank you very much.